Let's pray. We'll begin our study. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, grateful for this night, grateful that we have had by your good hand a pleasant Lord's Day. And now we come to close it out together by gazing into your word. As best we know our hearts, Lord, we want to be taught by you as we read tonight and as we think about the implications of what Jesus had to say to his followers in those closing hours and, and how that speaks to us today. Teach us, lead us, mold us, make us, shape us, change us, we pray. That we might become disciple makers who make disciple makers, increasingly so. In Jesus' name, amen. Jason, let's back off of the sound that a little bit. Uh, it's just a little, it seems like it's a little uh, hot, but wanting to bounce a little bit on us here. I think that's better. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, turn your Bibles to John chapter 15. John 15, we're looking at the third installment of this fourth phase uh, of Remain in Me. Come and see, come follow after me, uh, abide in me now. Now we're looking at remain in me, or abide in me, okay? Uh, hope you found John 15. I think it's still a little, little too much, Jason. Just, it's really kind of ringing up here to me, and it's, I, don't, I don't want to bear down and have something untoward happen. Okay. John chapter 15. I'm going to read to you verses 1 through 8. And then we're going to be looking at some more of John 15 tonight. Keep coming down. And uh, we'll look at some other things because we'll be thinking about the I am's. All right? The I am's. Okay. So stand with me if you would, and I'm, I want to read these verses, John 15, 1 through 8. Remember, these are the last words. These are, these are words that only John's gospel has. Uh, the, the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, move along pretty, pretty much in concert. John interlaps, intersects with them, interweaves with them. And then you get to this section here after the uh, experience in the upper room. In fact, it's called the upper room discourse. After that Passover transformation to the Lord's Supper, and there's this teaching block of material. And when you study through this and you read through this, you think how poor the church would be if we didn't have this. There's some rich, rich material here. Great teaching from our Savior. John 15, 1 to 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you're clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine. You're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. We've read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God to teach us this ten times in these verses going a little beyond what I read to you. The word abide comes up. Abide. Communion remaining. He's about to depart. We live 2,000 years since he departed, and his word to us today would be, abide in me. Thank you. Be seated. We've already commented on this, this material. We, we took a break last Sunday night to have a congregational meeting, but we, we looked uh, the week before at John 14. We've looked at John 13 prior to that. 
We see here in this material that Jesus is, as he's pressing, he's pouring these final teachings into these final hours with his disciples before he goes through his agony. He really is pressing the character issue here. To be like him. To think like him. I'm going to go ahead and give you the preview of my friend Tom Nettles uh, has a way of teaching. My, he was a, my history professor. He said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Then I'm going to tell you. Then I'm going to tell you what I told you. Well, I'm going to, I want to tell you what I'm going to tell you, okay? Prayer and feeding upon the Word are absolutely critical to becoming like Jesus Christ. Feeding on the Word is, is hearing from Him. Prayer is communicating with Him, communing with Him. And those are two critical things. And if we're going to be like Jesus, we need to understand who He claimed Himself to be. You know, there's, there were people that assigned things to Him that He didn't take unto Himself. He would sometimes dismiss them, sometimes embrace them. But who He declared Himself to be. And when you do that, you need to look at what I call, and I'm not, this is not original with me, the, the eight I am passages. Now before we get into those, I want to give you a little bit of a grammatical background. If we were doing this in English, and I wanted to emphasize that what I'm about to tell you about me is unique to me, I would say something like, I and I only am. Now the original language that the New Testament was written in, the Greek language, does that same thing a little differently. It takes the personal pronoun, and uh, the, the, we get our word ego from the personal pronoun for I, which is ego. And then it takes the verb of being, if we were to conjugate the verb to be, it would be I am, you are, he, she, or it is. We are, you plural are, they are. That's the conjugation of the, of the uh, verb to be, I am. Well, the form that follows this preposition, I, is the, is the term for I am, the first person singular of the verb of being. And so when, it, when you look at it and you study, it's, it's I. I am. And, and the force of it is I and only I. I and no one else am. And so he is, he's describing his uniqueness. In fact, there's more in it than that. Let's go back quickly just for a moment to the burning bush. You're Moses standing at the burning bush. A voice speaks from the burning bush. Moses, Moses, take off your sandals, for you're standing on holy ground. As Moses engages the voice in the bush, and he gets his instruction to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let my people go, he asks, and we looked at this on Wednesday nights, so some of this is just rehearsal, for, we're going to do this for some of you. Who shall I say has sent me? Tell them, and if you're reading it in the English, tell them I am sent you. And we looked at that on Wednesday nights, and we told you then that, that is a, that's the Hebrew, the Old Testament verb of being, hayah. When that verb takes on a noun, the force of a noun, it comes to us as Yahweh. When you bring that over into Old English, Yahweh becomes Jehovah. When Jesus makes these assertions, the way that he does it, they knew very well, the leaders knew very well what he was asserting about himself. He might as well have said, I am God. Because the way he said it, I and I only am. And so, so the, if, you, if you think about those passages, 
The first one I want to call your attention to happens earlier in John's gospel. It's in the midst of a controversy he's having back and forth, which in John chapter 8, verse 58. He's having this controversy with the, with the religious leaders because they don't believe him. He's chiding them because of that. And it gets, it gets intense, and he finally says, if you were Abraham's children, you would believe me. <laughs> but you're not his children. You're born of fornication. It just it totally offends them. And they, they press him, and then he finally makes it. He says, truly, truly. And that's, remember, that's the word amen. We, it comes to us as amen. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And there's that form. I am. And I only am. In other words, I existed. I pre-existed. He'd already said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Before Abraham was, I and I only am. Now let's go back. Let's go forward now. John chapter 14. We looked at this. I just want to, I want to put these eight things together tonight. I want to pack them together. <clears throat> he was claiming here his eternal pre-existence. And when they ask him to in John chapter 14 verse 6 to show us the way, he says, "I and I only am the way and the truth and the life." And to to reinforce that, to say it again, no one, so, so, so I and I only, which means no one else, no one comes to the Father except through me. That was a radical statement. Because the Jewish leaders taught that the way to God was through, uh, through their Interpretation and embracing that of the of the Tanakh of the of the law, the prophets, and the poetic writings. I am the way. Well, another another situation back in John chapter six. If you want to look there, John chapter six, verse thirty-five, he declared himself the bread of life. Give us bread to eat, they said. God gave our fathers manna in the wilderness. When they were traveling, he fed them. Jesus says in 635, I am. I and I only in the bread of life. He's already told them, you know, your fathers ate bread and died. But I and I only am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So he, and I was parenthetically, let me say that my favorite book outside the Bible, Pilgrim's Progress, that when faithful, I don't want, to, don't want to belabor this, but you really need to read this. If you don't read the whole Pilgrim's Progress, read the, the, the discussion between, between hopeful and Christian. Because hopeful's talking about the despair he went through when he cried out and, and he didn't get an answer from God. He said, then I saw that coming and believing are one. And it's, he sees that in a passage like this. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. In other words, you'll have, you'll have life when you come to embrace me for who I am. In another place, John chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am, I and I only am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Of course, we know he teaches elsewhere in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world, uh, because, because we, have, uh, we have seen his glory, the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ has shined on our hearts and convinced us to believe in him. And because we have seen his glory and we embrace him for who he is, then, then that light reflects off of us. And so here's the promise. Follow him and you not walk in darkness. Brothers and sisters, that's a wonderful promise for times like this, isn't it? The darker it gets, follow him and you won't walk in darkness because he's the light of the world. 
In fact, not only will you not walk in darkness, you will have the light of life, the, the life-bringing, life-giving light. He's telling us about his character here. And in another place in John chapter 10, verses 7 to 9, he describes himself as the, as the door or the gate to the sheepfold. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. By comparison there. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. You come through him. So you have this, this reminds you of no, no one comes to the Father. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Now, not only is he the way, he is the entrance point. And if you, if you understand these things and you read Pilgrim's Progress, you, you, you begin to see all the images. The, the wicked gate, that small gate, that's W-I-C-K-E-T, by the way. I was teaching one time and someone said, well, why would you go through a wicked gate? Well, there's not a D on the end, it's a T on the end. Wicked means small, all right? <laughs> He's the entrance. The only way you get into the sheepfold is through him. If you come into him, then, you, then you're opened to nurture. You have access to nurture. Well, just a couple of verses down from that, we have another I am saying. He's not only the door to the sheepfold. He's the shepherd. Look at this, verse 11. I am, I and I only am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. One of those amazing statements... Which was, which was true of a, of, a, of a shepherd who was a, was a qualified shepherd. He would defend his sheep to the death if were they to be encountered by wild animals. I had occasion this past week to pray at the, uh, at the wall, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Traveling Wall over at TJCC and uh, did that Thursday Thursday morning. Barry and Jerry and I were there, and uh, then I was called back Thursday evening uh, for a, for an opening ceremony there, and I was just reminded as I was there, just that Jesus. Talk, greater love has no man than this, than a man laid down his life for his friends. And it just gripped me that we're standing at a wall that commemorates the lives of servicemen and women who not only laid down their lives for their friends, they laid down their lives for, for total strangers. They laid down their lives for people who were protesting what they were doing for their, for their enemies. It's, it's incredible sacrifice. And that, that model, that example comes from Jesus Christ, who lays down his life for the sheep. And one more, and then we're going to come back to what he says in our passage tonight, John 15. John chapter 11, verse 25. Lazarus, his friend, has died. Jesus said to her, I am, I and I only am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Now think about what he has described here. <laughs> I am eternal, adored by Abraham. I am ultimate truth. I am the source of life, and I am the only way to God. Let me say, that's, that's going to get us in jail for too long, folks. But he said it. It's true. I'm the bread of life. You want to have life? Feed on me. This picture of communion that we're going to see in, this, in John 15. Be nourished by me. I'm the light of the world. 
You want to live in darkness or you want to come to the light and follow the light and be in the light? Then it's, then it's in me. I and I only, which means all other religious expressions, even the expression that he came in the context of, even the manifestation of Judaism, was by, by contrast, by comparison. Darkness compared to him. Ultimate irony, all those people who were looking for Messiah, who would go through the, uh, taking the torch and going to the, the hills, the celebration we call Hanukkah, rejected the light in the name of looking for the light. Ultimate irony. And I'm the gate. I'm, the, I'm the, not only the gate as entrance point, but the gate as safekeeping. And not only am I the gate, I'm the shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. I'm, I'm the one who lays down his life <coughs> for the sheep. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you see him hanging on the cross, you remember he laid down his life for the sheep. He laid down his life for his friends. He, he dies for those for whom he prays in John 17. I pray not for the world. I pray for those that you've given me. He effectually does that. He's the resurrection. He's the, he's the one in whom we hope that when we die, that's not the end. That we don't just become food for worms when we die. We die and go by his grace for his glory into eternity. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Joe Ramey read to us a passage from Corinthians this afternoon before we finished our pastoral ministries team meeting that I would, I want to depart and be with the Lord. And we have that confidence because he's the resurrection and the life that when we, if in Christ, that when we die, we do go to be with him. Now, that's a context for what we're looking at tonight, John 15, all right, because this is the, this is the final I am I'm going to show you. It's the final in terms of its, of its sequence in the, uh, in the Gospel of John. It's in John 15. I am, I and I only, verse 1, am the true vine. And he says it twice. He says it again in verse 5. I and I only am the vine. I'm the vine. Truth. And my father is the vine dresser or the husband, one, the one who, who cares. And I want you to notice here, verse 2. In this life, because of God's sovereign prerogative as the vine dresser or the husbandman over his creation, everybody gets cut. Nobody escapes that. Everybody gets cut. If you view humanity, if you take the analogy and view humanity as plants, every plant gets cut. The question is, will that plant be cut so as to be thrown away and burned? Or will it be cut so as to be pruned and grow? Listen to Jesus' language. Every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. It's not always obvious, you know, the, the, the psalmist would ask, why do the nations, why do, why do the heathen prosper and the people of God suffer? Well, the people of God are suffering because he's pruning us, he's shaping us, he's making us more like himself, more into the image of his son. The heathen may be growing wild and, and appear to be just flourishing, but there's an ax that's going to be laid at the root of the heathen. Everybody gets cut. Nobody escapes that in the sovereign plan of God. And then he starts talking about abiding in him. Abide in me. And I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Three times it's stated, it's implied a fourth time. Abide in me, and I, implied, abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, I want to use kind of a crude analogy. I'm not, I heard uh, one of my professors use this years ago. He said, let me tell you how, how important it is to be a part of the body of Christ. 
He said, I meet people from time to time who allege that they're a part of the church. They, they're members of a church. Now, you never, you never see them when the church gathers. It's, and it's not because they're hindered. We're not talking about people that physically cannot be a part of the folks gathering. We're talking about people that otherwise... Uh, I'm reminded of a woman years and years ago. I'd go by to see her. She ran a grocery store and she was a member. We were going through in that setting, the, uh, returning to a responsible approach to membership, meaningful membership. But she never came. And I noticed that she, she seemed to be able to do everything else. I would see her at football games. I would, of course, she was always in the grocery store when I went there. And you could argue, well, she had to be. She owned it, right? But she just couldn't ever, she just physically couldn't make it when the people of God gathered. And so this professor of mine in seminary, years before that, had said, I want to talk about being a part of the body. He said, what if I took an ax today and I cut off my little finger and I set it off to the side? Now that would be ghastly to watch. He said, but you, when you get the blood under control in my hand and my finger, he said, then the finger's sitting there. And is it, is it a part of my body? Well, it certainly is my little finger on, on this hand. And you could make an argument. You could talk about all the time that this finger had with my hand and with my body and how much it's meant to the body through the year. He goes, oh, no. He said, but you watch that over time. Watch it over time. What begins to happen to it? It begins to take on the properties of decay. It'll turn uh, some, some strange discolorations. Why? Because it doesn't have the life-flowing properties of blood. You could argue that that is my little finger, a part of my body. And no one would ever say, no, that's not your finger. Well, it certainly is my finger. But it doesn't have the life-flowing properties of blood nurturing it, sustaining it enhancing it. And he said, that, that's how foolish it is to assert the ones connected, organically connected to the body of Christ when one is not tapped into the blood so that there's not evidence of life <clears throat> flowing. Well, this, the analogy is the same here with the idea of the vine. Verse 4, abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, verse 5, I and I only, again, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now notice how he's intensified this here. Verse 4, the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. He ramps it up in verse 5. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For the principle is, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from the, apart from the, the, uh, the branch, the, 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 the trunk, the the life-giving force, a portion of it cut off, will not have life long. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And perhaps through the, I've, I've done this long enough that I've seen church members who people who were members of churches may still have their name on a membership, who wither, they, their soul shrivels, their joy shrivels. And he says, in such, these branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. A clear image there of being cast aside, cast into hell. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. He's talking here. If you abide in me, what does abiding in him look like? It's, it's 
praying to him, talking with him, communing as friend to friend. One of the hymns we sing says that. And my words abide in you. What is that? That's scripture. Where the word of Christ dwells in us richly, Paul says in Colossians. The word of Christ dwells in us richly. That's what I've said to you recently. We need to, it was last Sunday morning, we need to pray, dear God, I don't, help me, help the word to dwell, your word to dwell in me richly. Value. Blessing. Transformation. He says, if that is your status, then ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now notice the qualifier. He doesn't say, you hear these guys on television sometimes, to rip this, just in Jesus' name, ask whatever you want and he'll give it to you. That's not what it says here. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of ifs here. If you abide in me. If my words abide in you. If you have a vital, private prayer life. Folks, you know, that's something that really nobody knows but, but you and God. But it is that, what the, the old Puritans call that closet religion. When you're, when you're alone with God. And you pray and you honestly pour out your heart to him and you honestly listen for him to speak with the, with the Bible open feeding upon the word knowing that he speaks to you he's already spoken through his word Lord show me teach me it's in that setting that you can ask but why because a person who who has a vital prayer life and who has a hunger and is being nourished in the word is in tune with God, in communion with God, and is, and is inclined to pray for the glory of God and the cause of God and the name of God and, and, and the advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the, the cause of, of John Gill's magnificent writing that he wrote back in the 1700s, the cause of God and truth. He's, he's praying about that. It's your kingdom come, your will be done. It's, it's his heartbeat because he's, he's abiding in prayer. He's abiding in the word. And he says, by this my father is glorified. That you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. And of course there's been a big discussion about what fruit is. Certainly the fruit of the spirit comes into play here. Galatians 5. We could get some of our children, just gather them up here impromptu, and they, they would go through that with you, and they would sing, and they wouldn't be able to be still when they sing, because when they were taught Galatians 5 on the fruit of the Spirit, they were moving when they sang it, and they would go through it, but they would get through it pretty quickly. The fruit of the Spirit certainly is there. But it's also, it's the fruit of obedience. I want us to look at that. Fruit of obedience. Because you see, what Jesus has just described here is one who interacts with Scripture. It's, it's, it goes beyond Bible reading. It's an interacting with the Word. Being shaped by the Word. Challenged by the Word. Changed by the Word. Rebuked by the Word. Strengthened by the Word. Taught by the Word. And, and, and he prays. He prays. In the light of what God is showing him, he cries out to him. So what, what do we see? We see the call to obedience. Again, the catechism is so helpful here. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. John Piper says man's chief end is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. 
How do you, how do you glorify God? By loving Him and doing what He commands. Just look in John's Gospel. We, we kind of looked a little bit at this when we went through 14, but we, we did not connect 14 and 15 at this level. So I'm going to do this real quickly. Just look with me. John 14, verse 15. In chapters 14 and 15, obedience is commended five times. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. John 14, 23, Jesus answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. There's that, there's that communion. There's a little pamphlet I want to commend to you called My Heart, Christ's Home. It's available online for download free. If you can't find it and you're interested in reading that, let me know because I can send it to you. I can email it to you in a, in a PDF document format to read. But it's, it's so searching. My Father will love him. We'll come to him and make our home with him. And, and this, this writer goes through a just a kind of a room by room Jesus taking ownership of the house when he moves in. So that's the thing, isn't it? When the Lord Jesus comes into our lives to be our Lord and Savior, he's not a guest in our lives. He is our master. He owns it. Paul says, you're bought with a price. Do you not know you're not your own? You've been bought with a price? And then that's John 14. Look at John 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. There's that word abide again. And then John 15, 14. You are my friends if you do what I commanded you. And of course we told you recently, we showed you recently in 1 John 5, this is love to God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not a burden. So abiding has to do with, with obeying. Think about it. If you gave to a child a meaningful list, whatever you're going to call them, chores or whatever, and I want to be careful here because I don't want to appear to be moving into a works mentality, but I want to try to drive home this point of obedience. And there's the list of this is what mommy and daddy need for you to do. And they imagine that they are obeying mommy and daddy by doing whatever they want to do irrespective of a list that's been given to them. And they look shocked when you approach them and say, you know, this, this was here, this was right here, and, and I notice you didn't do this. And they would go, well, but I, but I did this and this and this. See, folks, I think that's where a lot of people live today. They're shocked when you suggest that, that the Word of God has a problem with, with their conduct or maybe their, the absence of conduct. Totally shocked. And yet, the commands, they're not a mystery. He's been pretty plain. We know at the heart of them is, is love. We know that the, that the Ten Commandments, which are the, which are the summary of the law of God, uh, captured in the Ten Commandments, have, talk about love for God and love for others. We know that the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your being, and the second is likened to it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. We know that, that love drives all of this. 
But my point is, if you're not in the Word, interacting with the Word, how does a person know that he or she is obeying God or not? And you know what the answer in this culture is, in the, in the remaining part of the culture that actually has some sort of measure of esteem for this word? Forget, forget the culture that totally discounts this word, but the culture that has some sort of esteem, they, they imagine that it's in there. They read it into the Bible rather than drawing it out of the Bible. And that's why, by the way, if you ever try to have a conversation with someone who claims to be a Christian, you hear some of the strangest things. And years ago, I started, and when I would have those kind of encounters with people, I, was, I would say, I learned to say, that's an interesting observation. Where did you get that from the Bible? And folks, this does not require that you have a seminary degree. We're talking about just interacting with the Word, being faithful to read the Bible, to listen to the Bible. We, we have it in so many formats today. To interact, to engage the scriptures and let it engage your life. And, and when that is absent, and see, Jesus says, you're my friends if you, if you do whatever I command you. What, how, do, how can we be his friends if we don't know? Obedience is the key. It's not legalism. In fact, Augustine, one of the early church fathers, said, love God and do whatever you please. And folks went, oh my God, love God, do whatever I please. But you see, Augustine knew that if you love God, then you want to do what pleases him. That's what pleases you. And when you find yourself doing otherwise, you repent. Notice the Apostle Paul admitted his sin, put it right out there. I'm the chief of sinners, the things that I know I should do. I don't. But he never made an excuse for his sin. You notice that? Never. Not when he became a Christian. He never excused his sin. It's been a goodly portion of his teaching, admonishing folks how to deal with remaining sin. And so if we're going to be like Jesus, we have got to interact with him in, uh, in prayer and uh, in, in engaging him in the scriptures. Ian Bounds, if you're familiar with that name, he wrote volumes, I mean, I don't know how many, 15, 20 volumes on prayer, was a prayer warrior, man of prayer. He said, the men who have most fully illustrated Christ in their character and have most powerfully affected the world for him have been men and women who spent so much time with God as to make it a notable feature of their lives. I want to touch on a couple of things before we close tonight. It's the idea of what the challenges are. Someone said the battle for spending meaningful time with God is fought on three fronts. Priorities, scheduling, and discipline. In fact, a survey was taken. I want to share this with you. A survey of Christian leaders revealed a number of reasons for difficulty in maintaining a regular devotional life with God. 34% said time was the greatest problem. 9% said distractions. 7% said consistency. And 6% Talk about the difficulty of discipline. Priorities, scheduling, and discipline. We must make it a priority. You know, if you wait until it's convenient, we have an enemy of our souls who will see to it that it will never be convenient. That's the way he operates. We need to realize that we are all given the same amount of time. And then we must pray.
practice self-denial. Deny ourselves of something we could legitimately claim to be our own for the greater good of something which is much greater for the good of our souls. And it really is the path of joy. Interacting with God in His Word, praying and communing with God, abiding in Him, that's what it looks like. You see, when we give Him joy, we know that it pleases Him. He delights in this. When, it, when we give Him joy, you know what? It gives us joy. One writer, I think it's Bill Hull, defined joy this way. A sense of well-being as a result of a job well done. It's the inner knowledge that regardless of circumstances, I am pleasing God. Joy, by the way, is not the same as happiness. You see, happiness is tied to the circumstances. Joy is tied to communion with God. Particularly when one finds delight in obeying God. This is what, remember what Paul said at the end of Romans 7 when he was very honest about his struggle with remaining sin. What did he say? So key. Nevertheless, I delight after the law of God in my inmost being. What's he telling us there? My joy is not tied to the circumstances because I get so frustrated with myself and the situation. My joy is tied to the communion I have with the Lord and His Word which enlightens me. Someone said that com complaining about obedience being a critical part, obedience to God being a critical part of the Christian life is like complaining that there are guardrails on the roads up the mountains in Colorado. If you've ever driven those, Joe, I know you've been up. If you've ever driven the roads that don't have rails, what is the thing you want? Rails. The rails are not there to restrict your freedom in driving. They are there to protect you, keep you on the path. Help you to avoid veering off the path. So with that now, I want to I leave us getting ready to look at John 16 next week, Lord willing. We are the vine and the branches. We're in the vine. We're in the, we're the branches. So the question I have for you now as we close is, has there been a time in your life when you were more vitally connected to the vine? Are you experiencing the pruning effects of the God who owns the vineyard? Because that is what happens to people who are in Christ, who are getting our life flow from him. Now, brothers and sisters, I realize that, that what can happen is life can set in on us and, and, and get us distracted and all, and, and, the, and the vitality can be, begin to be sapped. And I don't want you to despair. I don't, like this is not a gloom and doom study. You see, we have a Savior who delights in showing mercy. And we are as close, how close are we to becoming vital again? We're as close as repenting of dullness, repenting of distractions, crying out, Oh Lord Jesus, I want to be near to you. I, I want to know you. Paul said in the power of you. I, I want to know resurrection power in me. To experience and live and believe that the same power that conquered the grave lives in me. I want that relationship with you again. Or I want it to grow more and more. I want your word to dwell in me richly. I don't.
Bible is an amazing book. Some of you have taught for decades. I've, I've taught the Bible for decades, read the Bible for decades. But it is so fresh when you come to it wanting to, wanting to be nurtured by it. It's so fresh. So meaningful, so pleasant, so blessed. So nurturing, so helpful. When you come wanting to be fed the bread of life by him who is the bread of life. Jesus' character is how he described it in these I Am passages. And he wants that character shaped in you and me. And the only way it will be is in a meaningful interaction with his word and a meaningful time of communing with him in prayer with a view to obeying him, loving him, and keeping his commandments. But you're going to have to fight for it. Because this is the battleground right here. If the devil can get you to be dull, if the devil can get you to be tired about these things, if the devil can get you to be distracted, then he can lead you with your willingness to be unfruitful. The fruit of the Spirit won't be obvious. It won't be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, self-control. It won't be something very different from that. And I submit to you while we've always needed to manifest the fruit of the Spirit, in these days in which we live, the next 23 days, the next 30 days, the next, we need to be people full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, self-control. Because the population is going to lose a lot of that and manifest a very different edge. And we have the light. God, help you, help me to live in a compelling way that those in the dark will be attracted to the light. If they become more like Jesus and they desire to be like Jesus, then we can engage in that marvelous practice as disciple makers of making disciple makers because that and only that is the way to see this culture healed. Let's talk. Just a few minutes. Just take a few minutes of your time to hear what's on your mind. We have a uh, we have a mic, don't we? Let's see. Joshua, would you handle the the mic if anyone has any questions or comments or observations? Anyone? talking about heart stuff is not easy. Test, test, test. There we go. Joe? So, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I think that that uh, we are often deceived like you said when we we wonder why we aren't bearing the fruit you know why why don't I have joy and why isn't there peace in my life I'm going to church and I'm I'm still a Christian and I should have this joy and peace and if somebody said to me well maybe you're not abiding which means like you said and we just don't think about it I guess is I my prayer life is is questionable my uh, time in the word is uh, it even if even if it exists it exists from a carnal or you know uh, maybe the discipline is like exercise you don't enjoy <laughs> yeah perfunctory it's just perfunctory I have to do my sit-ups today mm -hmm. I have to read my Bible today and why am, why don't I have joy and when I'm reading the Bible well abiding is is abiding it's it's letting the blood flow through you mm -hmm. the juices flow sure. joy and peace are the natural fruit and and the consequences are 
that I will be a light that shines. Yeah, you're right, Joe. You could carry it. You could carry a severed finger on with you everywhere you go. I don't understand why the fingers. Why isn't it pink? Why isn't it supple? Why isn't it? It's right here. People do mistake. I think they mistake doing, like going to church. I mean, I've talked to folks like that. But I do this, and I do that. Okay, that's good. But I'm talking. It's, abiding is about being. Right. Well, it's, it's about a being. Easy thing now to counsel yourself and that's what we should do it's really hard when somebody comes to you and you see that they're not having joy and what right. do you say do you say hey well maybe you need to you know check your mm -hmm. check out the here's here's what i say i mean well tell me about your devotional life i don't want to pry i'm not i'm not being nosy i'm not i'm not my motives are not ulterior but i'm just curious to know tell me about tell me about your time in the word well, I, you know, I try to get in five minutes every... Okay. What about praying? Well, I, try, I pray you when I... Would. Okay. Let's, let's take the analogy of marriage. I say to you, Boy, I don't understand. Karen and I don't seem to be close. Well, when's the last time uh, you really sat down together and, and you talked and you, you shared verbally with her the love that you have for her and you showed her the love you have for her and you listened to her? Well, I mean, I told her I love her, kissed her on the way out the door. You see, it's not a mystery, is it? How could we be close if that's what it, it consists of? Well, this, we've got to remember the mystery of Christ in the church is, is manifested in marriage. It's right there. And if we take that analogy and say, well, tell me, tell me about the time you... What do you, what do you and your spouse do for quality time, what do you do intentionally, not accidentally? What just, what kind of happen? What do you do intentionally to know one another? First Peter three seven says, "Husbands, know your wives. Treat your according to knowledge. You treat them with respect." Well, that's a that's not easy thing. But you, if you've been married any length of time at all, you know, guys, that the more time you put into that, the better the relationship is. The Lord knows what he's talking about. So I, th I think, Joe, that's what we do. I just ask folks, open into how. Tell me about your devotional life. Not to lord it over you, but just... Because this is where it happens. If it's not happening in the closet, as the Puritans called it, then it doesn't... Wherever else it happens is running on fumes. It's in the closet that the fuel is, is revitalized. The tank is filled again. The, the energy is there. The perspective is there. And I think in this uh, instant society where we want everything now, and that the idea of abiding is a, is a mystery to people and a, and a lost science and a lost art. And yet it is it's the heart and soul. It's... Think about what Jesus emphasized with these disciples just before he departed. Because he, he wasn't going to be there physically. They were going to have to learn to abide in him without him there. Remain in me. So you're right. It, it is the heart of the matter when people don't have joy. What do most people think would make them joyful? Hmm? What? Yeah, yeah. You know, something... something Something nice and tangible, a change in circumstances, an improvement in this, that, and the other. This, this young man this morning who saw, Kojo, you think he had joy? He had a yo-yo. A yo-yo from years ago. Clearly, he had something besides a yo-yo, didn't he? He'd been introduced to Jesus Christ, brought to faith in him. And had joy in Christ. Linda, you told me, I think, that one of these videos we're going to see is a young woman, I believe, who still has her box. Is, is this the one you're talking about? From years ago. Yeah. It's not, it's not circumstances. It's, it's how connected are you to the... What's, what's the flow look like? Well, it's depending on how connected you are to the fountainhead, isn't it? If, if the hose has been pinched... The flow is going to be different, isn't it? Let's see. Yes, you. 
Norman and then Norman or me? Well, you go since you've got the mic and walk toward Norman. You, you can turn down a little bit, Jason. Those two blue knobs. Joe hit upon something that just triggered something in my mind, and and the the phrase that that came to my mind is uh, crucial conversations. I think mm -hmm. there's a book about that about having the courage to have crucial conversations with, with those that you're either, that are employees or, or relatives mm -hmm. or close friends, whatever. And, and I think maybe the re one of the, the uh, I don't know if it's a symptom or a reason that we don't abide in, in Christ as much anymore is because we've chosen as a family of God to, to stop having those uncomfortable, crucial <laughs> conversations where we go, how how are you doing you know in the closet are you are you having those times are you spending time with god what i don't know last time i asked somebody that yeah. you know and had that critical mm -hmm. maybe awkward conversation yeah. with them it's been asked of me and i was always surprised i was like wow they had that, was, that took a little bit of gumption to <laughs> ask me that yeah that's almost like being nosy in it yeah but but i was but, like I appreciate it because it, it gave me pause sure. to think. But I think maybe maybe as a family of God that we maybe step back and say, I've I've not done my brother and sister a service by by avoiding that time. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I think you're right. I think we've carried over the you don't talk religion and politics on the world <laughs> yeah. into our church. Right. Right. <laughs> and, we, and we can leave politics out. That's fine. But yeah. but we're all about. You're right, right. <laughs> Religion in the best expression of the term. Yeah. It's good. It's good, Josh. No one? Got a mic coming to you. Um, you mentioned priority, scheduling, and discipline. Can you just say again the, the context of that? Okay. The, the <clears throat> quote or... Yeah. Make... We, We've got to make it a priority. Okay. While, while there are exceptions to this rule, isn't the rule of life that we typically find time to do that which is valuable to us? Yeah. And so, and as Josh talked about, we don't want to admit that maybe a time like this, which is, we're talking about a, a a quiet time, you can call it a devotional time, time alone with the Lord, communion, that it's, that it's not easy. We don't want to admit that it's not easy. And I was delivered from, I, there was a time in my ministry years ago when I thought, I really thought I was going insane. I was struggling with some, and, and this, one of the dear pastor friends, a man that I esteemed as much as anybody on the planet, came and preached at the church I was pastoring. He had just turned 50. I was in my 30s. We were walking to my house one day. He put his arm around me. He said, Bill, he said, I turned 50 this year. Now, this man, I would have told you, is one of the most godly men, one of the most powerful preachers. He was a man that, when John MacArthur was asked about that time, who is the most powerful preacher in America? He named Albert N. Martin. Okay. And he was walking. We were walking to my house. He said, Bill, I turned 50 this year. And he said, I'm doing a lot of evaluating. I said, Pastor Martin, I said, what, is the, what, is, what do you struggle with most in Christian life? And I was, I was struck. It was tough. And he said, you know something? I struggle with being alone with God in the closet more than I do anything else in my life. And I, you could have knocked me over with a feather. But I learned from then the emphatic word is struggle. Not ignore, not avoid, not give in, not give up, not, not move on, not, not reduce it, but to struggle. Because it is counterintuitive to who we are. So, so to make it a priority, Norman, number one, that, that this... Martin Luther said in the Reformation, I have so much to do today, I have got to give at least two hours in communion with God. <laughs> what a way to think. Joseph Elaine, who was one of the Puritans, uh, had a, had a uh, 
well, not a shoe business, but a tinkering type business. Where, and he would, he would grieve when he would hear the shopkeepers up and down the street hammering on things. He said, how could anybody be up about their work before me, a gospel minister? We were rebuked by that. So it's got to be a priority. We've got to see the value of it and the priority of it, okay? And then, uh, then we've got to, uh, it's, and how does that come? It's through discipline. It's just not going to happen automatically. Mm -hmm. Were these three elements of abiding? It, was that the context? It is, it, is the, it is the way to cultivate and continue abiding as you make these, yeah, you make these a priority. And you, and you practice the discipline. That's a good point. Steve? And um, just kind of on the other comment, um, just to lift up Paul Carter, he's really good about those conversations. Yes, he is. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a blessing. Mm -hmm. And then for me, I want to just work on having, well, just more fellowship. My schedule's so random, and mm -hmm. between that and my kids, it's like it's hard to schedule anything else. So. Yeah. I think that's important to you. Sure, and exactly. It's, it's, a, it's one of the things. It's not just, we're not talking about being monastic where you simply draw aside. A part of the, we talked this morning about employing the means of grace. One of the means of grace is gathering together for worship, gathering together for fellowship. You know, Steve and I were talking about this this afternoon. You know, given his circumstances right now, he finds himself lonely. Well, brothers and sisters, the last place in the world a person ought to be lonely is in the body, the body of Christ. But our ears need to perk up about that and say, wait a minute. We need to engage on this brother's behalf. And, and realize that not use his, his schedule and challenges as an excuse, but, but use them as, a, uh, as an opportunity to work around them and prove that, that we are the body of Christ. And if he's hurting with loneliness, then the scripture says all of us should be hurting somewhat. But it's, it's, a, it's not, just, not just private, but public. It's, it's all of those. Good point, Steve. Anybody else? Other thoughts about this? Good question. Is it better to have joy over happiness? And it definitely is because joy is tied to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is, he is faithful. Uh, he, is, he is always with us. And, and it is actually the way in that we have meaningful happiness. Helpful happiness. There's, you know, it's amazing how, where people find happiness. And, and they'll say, well, I'm just finding joy. No, you're not finding joy. If you, joy is, is in Jesus Christ. Love, joy, peace. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And, and if you have joy in Christ, it's amazing what you will find to be happy. If you have joy in Christ, a yo-yo given years ago will bring a smile to your face when you talk about it. <laughs> and I think joy is the, is the path to true happiness. If you, if you have joy, you don't give up happiness. What you do is you avoid the devil's snare. And we'll just listen to people. Look at how unhappy they are. Well, why? You know, they're looking for love in all the wrong places. Some people say they're, 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 uh, they've attached their uh, sense of well-being to things and to people. And I promise you, things are going to change. People will let you down. But you attach yourself to Jesus Christ and the outflow of that the joy of the Lord is our what? strength and people in their weakness run after the elusive butterfly of whatever and even if they catch it it never satisfies does it? never does look at people Somebody, I think my brother said, you know, the danger of chasing the American dream is that you might catch it. And when you catch it, what do you do with it? I mean, it's just, it's, it just, it will, it will, it disappoints. It will not, it must satisfy. Augustine said, there is a God-shaped void in our hearts. And we are discontent until we fill it with him. And yet you know people, and I know people who try to fill that God-shaped void with everything else in the yeah. world. And all it does, like the slew of despond in Pilgrim's Progress, you're going to get tired of me talking about that, but Pilgrim's Progress, in the slew of despond, the more they try, they tried to cross it to get onto their journey, and the more they poured stuff into it, the deeper it got, because it does not satisfy. It is the slew of despond, and all it produces is despondency. So, joy, more valuable, but joy, more 